I appreciate y'all coming again. And those of you who stuck around, uh, I want to thank you because by now you know what you're getting. And uh, you chose to be here anyway, so thank you for that. And uh, For those of you who are here for the first time, thank you for coming to this class uh, when you had all the other great options. You know, what's funny is Brother Ralph Gilmore is speaking tonight. And uh, some of you know Brother Ralph from the Red River Family Encampment. Uh, Brother Ralph was one of my instructors at Freed Hardeman University. So my undergraduate degree is in science. I, I grew up the son of a gospel preacher, but I didn't want to preach. Um, because I saw the, all the ins and outs from a, a family perspective. And so I said, I can go do something else and not have the headaches and yada, yada, yada. Uh, but I, that's why I tell you, God is, has an interesting way of working things out. And so I went to Middle Tennessee State University to get my degree in science. I wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon. So I, was, I played college football for two weeks. I wasn't good enough to play long term. But I went then into the athletic training department at the university setting and had all the human anatomy and physiologies. I, I say in my, my studies, one of the cool things was I, had to, I got to go to the College of William and Mary up in Williamsburg, Virginia and dissect portions of the human body. So uh, that was cool. It was weird. Uh, I had to dis dismiss myself at one point when we were dealing with a lady's left hand because you know what goes on the left hand. And I just started thinking, I bet this finger had a ring on it and it was holding a child's hand at one time. And they said, if you ever start personalizing the, uh, the cadaver, you need to leave the room. And so I had to. But I had a lot of fun in that field of study. But when I graduated, immediately a congregation called me and said, hey, we're looking for a, a summer youth minister. Uh, we just lost ours. We're going to be hiring one. Would you be interested? And I thought, man, this would be a great way to have free pizza go to Six Flags and play paintball. I thought this is going to be an awesome summer job. And now 22 years later, here I, here I am. So I went on to get my master's degree. I graduated from a school of preaching in Nashville. Uh, it was one I could work and go to school at the same time. But then uh, Fried Hardeman is in Tennessee and uh, got my master's from there. But Brother Ralph was one of the teachers that I had. And so he's speaking tonight. I'm really looking forward to him tonight. But that's why I say thank you for coming to this class because there are so many other great speakers and so I'm very grateful that you came to this class. We're going to study today uh, from 1 Corinthians. If you want to open your Bible there, take notes, specifically verses 8 through 11, or chapters 8 through 11, but we're not going to cover all the chapters, but you're going to see how we're going to do it as we deal with the subject to follow me as I follow Christ. Before we begin, though, let's go to our Father in prayer. Heavenly Father, you are amazing, and we're grateful. Lord, as we come before you, it's not just because we're starting a class, it's because we don't want to stop talking with you. Lord, thank you for hearing from us. Thank you for caring for us. And I pray that as we this week maybe are reminded afresh that you are a regular part of every day of our lives, not merely on Sundays and Wednesdays. Help us to live that way as we leave here and to, uh, to enjoy being encouraged and having our flame fanned by others who are here. Heavenly Father, we do ask that you guide us in our time of study and as the speaker... I want you to be glorified, Lord, so please help me stay out of your way. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, as we begin, I want to start off by telling you a, an account, a story. Um, and this is a true story, believe it or not. You know, sometimes preacher stories, you're like, I don't know, was that a preacher story or was it a true story? Well, this is one of those true story things, right? Didn't look it up online. It just is what it is because it's my life. I am one of these guys who is very allergic to poison ivy. Have you, I don't, do y'all have poison ivy, poison oak out here um, in, okay, I didn't know where it stops, right? I didn't know where it grows, but I know this much. In the southeast, it doesn't stop. And it'll take over your entire yard. It'll take over a fence line. Um, and I'm the guy, if I get anywhere near it, uh, I am very allergic to it. I don't even have to touch it. If a dog walks into it, and then comes up to me and then rubs my leg and I have shorts on, then I actually will become, uh, uh, you know, get the rash. The last time I had poison ivy, it stuck with me, I believe, no joke, for three months. Because when I get it, I get it good, right? Some of us are good catchers. We catch some things, footballs, baseballs, I catch poison ivy, right? I got it off of a Frisbee once. We were out playing Frisbee disc golf, cheap man's, poor man's, you know, golf. And uh, somebody threw a Frisbee in the woods, and uh, lo and behold, it, it got across some of that, and the oil got on the Frisbee, right? 
It's so much so uh, with some that they get so allergic that you can actually burn poison ivy. And they say you're not supposed to because the oils within the fire can actually go airborne. And if somebody like me comes on who's very allergic, I don't even have to get near the plant. But if you're burning it and I'm near the fire and the oils get on me, or you can actually breathe the oils in and get poison ivy on the inside. So they make shots for guys like me. And uh, I usually don't try to get too many shots, but on that one, the last time I had it, I was like, I'm done. So the good thing is I can tell you what product to buy and what product not to buy to deal with poison ivy. uh, And I can tell you where to get the nearest shot. Now, here's the deal. This lesson's not about poison ivy, okay? This lesson is not. You, uh, and I love as the guest speaker because at times, and I'll be real with you, I love to preach where the audience has to experience something. I don't believe that um, preaching was meant just to relay information. And I really try to take that into my classes too because I believe experiential learning is some of the best learning. And here's the deal. Uh, This class is not about poison ivy. It's about your reaction to what I was just doing. And here's what I was just doing. I show you a picture of an individual, of somebody who's scratching because they itch. I tell you, so I've engaged your eyes... I'm engaged your ears in telling you how allergic I am. And then I also displayed before you, what did I start doing as I was talking? Yeah, and I don't itch at all, just so you know. Right now, I do not itch anywhere. But the reason I was doing that is because, have you ever noticed when somebody yawns and you see that, what happens typically? Somebody feels like they have to yawn. You didn't feel that way before, but when you see it, that's what you experience. And it's interesting when I tell the account of me being allergic to poison ivy to see what happens in an audience. Because all of a sudden, whereas you didn't have an itch before, maybe you get a little squirmy. Some of you, you actually started scratching a little bit. And whether or not you have an itch before that came in, maybe you do. I don't know. But what I do know is this. You displayed something that happens on a regular basis, and that is called imitation. You imitated... Because you saw it, you experienced it, you did it. Now, I want you to understand something. Imitation is not a bad thing. Copying is not a bad thing necessarily, right? Sometimes it is. We drive a lot across America. Uh, Our oldest son is in college now, so he's not with us on a regular basis. And our daughter's about to graduate and be gone. So my family of six is going to all of a sudden, we walk into a restaurant and only need a table for four. I don't like this phase of my life. Okay, I really don't. I'd like to build a, you know, give me a hundred acres and I'll build a compound and we'll just keep them and somehow miraculously they're going to meet somebody and marry and then they're all going to get 25 acres each and, you know, grandma and grandpa's house will be in the middle and I'll give them all golf carts and they can all just send their children to grandma and grandpa's house and I can send them home on the golf. That's my ideal. I don't like this sending my kids out, but that's the way God intended, right? I was having a conversation with somebody the other day, Psalm 127 talks about how blessed a man is whose quiver is full of arrows. That's his children. And of course, arrows were never designed to stay in a quiver. Just like your kids and mine were never designed to stay with us forever in our homes. Although my 11-year-old tells me that's where he's going to be for the rest of his life. As he becomes a YouTube video gamer, I said, we got problems, son. You and I got to talk. You got to learn to you know, we got to get you a job real quick. But anyhow, the idea is this. Um, copying can be a bad thing. Driving across the country, you know, you know, the child starts talking in the back seat and his brother all of a sudden starts mocking him, right? Hey, you want to do this? And the, the brother's sitting beside him going, hey, you want to do that? Right? And you're like, man, won't stop copying me. Won't stop copying me. Stop, stop, stop copying, right? But the idea is sometimes it's, it's bad. Sometimes it's good, though. You think about men when you used to watch your father and grandfather shave. I want you to think about that. I don't know if that was you ever wanting to be around your heroes. I love my, my dad and my grandpa. Both of my grandpas really were, were, all three of them were heroes to me. I come from a line of faithfulness. I'm what's, I'm what's called a link in a chain. If you've ever studied uh, Steve Farrar's book, Anchorman, um, some people are anchor men. In other words, they are the first faithful individuals in their family. And every other link of that chain builds from them. I am a link in a chain of faithfulness. Uh, Grandfather who was an elder, dad was a gospel preacher, grandfather a gospel preacher. 
Uh, and so I, I, I want to pass that on. That's the challenge for me is don't break the chain in my generation. And I talk to my kids about that. They are links in a chain. Don't break the chain, right? So here's the deal. I have heroes. You have heroes. Well, most men, we learn how to do things as men by watching the men in our lives that we respect, whom we respect. And so as a young child, you may watch your father, your grandfather shave. And what's funny is we even have times where grandchildren may look up at a grandpa and say, hey, I want some of that. And they want you to put that shaving cream on their face, right? And the first thing you think of is, will my wife see it, right? Because you don't want to get... Then it's the idea of, hey, well, I want to use that razor on my face. And then you're going, oh boy, if his mama finds out, right? So what they've done is they've made it easier on us men. They now make it where you can go buy, it's just the plastic piece that looks like a razor, but it has no razor in it. And so a grandchild or a little boy who's watching you wanting to shave with you, you can put that shaving cream on their face and then they can take that and just scrape the piece of, piece of plastic on their face and just get the shaving cream off, right? But we learn a lot of things by doing stuff like that. Ladies, it may not have been uh, you know, that exact thing for you, but uh, I, I love this particular tale. And as far as I know, it is a preacher tale uh, about a young girl and a mother who were cooking a ham one Sunday and the mother cut the ends of the ham and wanted to know why. And the mother, the, the daughter wanted to know why. And the mother said, well, my mom did it. So they called grandma. Grandma said, well, we do it because my mom did it. Great grandma was still alive. They called. And ultimately, at the end of the day, the only reason great grandma did it is because the pan wasn't big enough, right? But you think about how much we imitate those who've gone before us. Now, I'm going to tell you, I'm a real guy. There is zero pretense I will tell you readily, I am not perfect. I will tell you I need God's grace maybe more than you need God's grace. But I will also tell you this. There are some lessons that smack me right in the face. This is one of those lessons. I don't tell you that because I want you to be smacked in the face. I tell you that because the Scripture lays down a challenge for you today. This is not me. This is the Scripture. And here it is. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and verse 1, the Apostle Paul basically drew a line in the sand. And he told the church at Corinth, if you follow me, then it will be like you're following Jesus. Now, don't hear something within that that he didn't intend. Paul understood he was the chief of sinners. He would tell young evangelists that. It never escaped his mind that at one point in time he sat at the feet of Gamaliel and he was something within the Pharisees. and He, he was uh, born into the right tribe, born on the right day, circumcised on the right day, but he also understood he was the guy persecuting those of the way. He was the one who held the coat of the men who stoned Stephen and he would readily admit, I need God's grace. But even with all of that, he would still lay down this line before the Corinthian church and he'd say this, you follow me. And it'll be as if you're following Jesus. Here's why this lesson smacks me in the face. My wife's name is Aaron. We've been married 21 years. My oldest son's name is Colton. He's 19. My daughter's name is Michaela. She's 17. I have a red-headed son named Camden. He's 13. And our youngest is Bennett. He's 11. This smacks me in the face because I know they're watching me. And the reality is where daddy steps, they believe that's where they're supposed to step. So I make no pretense about this lesson. It's uncomfortable for me. But I need to be uncomfortable. I need to be reminded of this. Right? And I want you to be reminded. So here's the deal. How are we going to come to understand what he was talking about? Because there's so many different directions a lesson like this could go. Follow me as I follow Christ, right? Imitate me as I am also an imitator of Christ Jesus. Uh, there's so many di different directions you could take, but the best way to go about this is to just take the direction that the Apostle Paul took within the book of 1 Corinthians. Let's just stay within this book. And what you're going to find out is that the book, 16 chapters, uh, it's divided into the opening where he deals with some situations that are going on in the first six chapters uh, in Corinth. Um, you know, he, he talks about their preacher worship uh, in the first few chapters, how he would uh, talk about, has Christ been divided? That's where that text comes from. Uh, he talks about preacher worship, and he really does a great job of defining who preachers are within a congregation. And I, I am very pro-preacher. I am very pro-elder. Um, 
As a matter of fact, I don't like it when people talk bad about them, maybe even if, even if quote unquote, we deserve it, right? Because I view that as this is a guy trying his best. I genuinely believe he's trying his best to, to glorify God. You know, I, I, I like to give people that benefit of the doubt. Um, but in Corinth, what they had turned that into was we are elevating certain men instead of elevating God. And he said at any point in time you start doing that, you've got it off. And so he really did go into great illustration of a, a preacher being a farmer. Uh, farmers aren't really great, you know, as far as high uh, executives or people that you might think of as needing to be worshipped, uh, right? But one of the best illustrations that I think he went into was that preachers are under rowers. Uh, on a ship, back in the day, if you were to purchase passage on a ship, you would be on the top decks where the uh, air would blow, there, there would be uh, instruments that were played, maybe there would be meals that were had on the top decks. Um, but underneath there, when an individual gave a command, there was a group of men that would shove an oar out the side of the boat. And there was an individual, a taskmaster maybe, calling out signals underneath a rowmaster, and he would be directing when you're supposed to pull and when you're supposed to push, Right? Now, you and I look at that and go, well, that's where the, maybe the slaves were. That, those guys were called under rowers. And the Apostle Paul says, that's really what preachers are when it comes to the big picture of the work of the Lord. Don't put them on a pedestal. Don't put any of us speakers on a pedestal. We're under rowers trying to advance the cause of Christ for those who are on the boat, Right? Now, here's the deal. When you really look at that, the Apostle Paul addresses that, but then he's got to address some other issues that are going on. There's a guy that's got his father's wife, an indication that he's sleeping with his stepmother. And the church at Corinth is just letting it happen. They're not saying anything. It's almost like everybody knows it in the congregation, but nobody's saying anything, right? And so Paul calls them out for that. But he calls them out for more than that. They're, they actually have conflict within the church, and they're taking each other to court. That's in chapter 6. They're, they're dragging the Lord's church through the mud. And he says, don't you have wise men amongst yourselves? And that's a lesson that needs to be had today. I've known very few individuals, brothers and sisters in Christ, when they had a disagreement of legal nature, where they actually, instead of going to the courts, they went before an eldership. And they told the elders, we just want you to hear us out, both sides, and whatever you determine, we both agree to settle it at that level. Let's keep it out of the publicity. Let's keep it out, right? And I know sometimes, you know, maybe it gets to a point where you don't have that heart set within both groups. And so you can't go before the elders because maybe one party won't agree to that or whatever it is. But in Corinth, the Apostle Paul in the first six chapters, he's addressing some pretty serious issues. And then in the latter part, from chapter 7 through chapter 16, he's addressing questions that they've had. And we can see that because... There are some structural markers in 1 Corinthians that give us indication of paradigms. Now, paradigms are kind of segments of thought, if you want to look at it that way. And so the best way to study a passage of Scripture is you've got to get it in its immediate context and then advance from there outward. So if we're going to understand what he was saying in 1 Corinthians 11, be imitators of me as I also am of Christ then we've got to find the paradigm that that's in and then build out from there, right? So what we're going to do is this. I want to show you this from a structural marker. Chapter 7, verse 1 is where the first structural marker is found. The Bible says this, Now concerning the things about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. We will move on beyond that passage, right, men? It's okay to laugh in Bible study. It's okay. <laughs> Verse 25 is another one. Now concerning virgins, I have no command of the Lord, but I give an opinion as one who by the mercy of the Lord is trustworthy. Chapter 8, verse 1. Now concerning things sacrificed to idols. You actually have to go over to chapter 12, verse 1 to find the next structural marker where it says, now concerning spiritual gifts, right? Then you turn over to chapter 16, verse 1, and you'll find the next one, now concerning the collection for the saints. And some scholars will put verse 12 in there of chapter 16, but concerning Apollos, our brother. Now, in all of those structural markers in the latter half of, of the book of 1 Corinthians, they all start with the same phrase, now concerning. 
That's why I can tell you from chapter 17 through chapter 16, there are some structural markers that give an indication the division of the book should be the first six chapters and then chapter 7 through 16, right? Now here's the deal. Chapter 11 is our text and it falls in a paradigm between chapter 8 verse 1 and chapter 12 verse 1. That's why I told you we're going to study chapter 8, 9, and 10. But we're not going to obviously dive into it in totality. But I want to learn what the Apostle Paul was saying when he said, be imitators of me. i got to be real with you again. It's a whole lot easier for me to tell my children, do as I say and not as I do. It's a whole lot easier if the Apostle Paul within this text is all he is saying is, hey, take your kids to worship. Because your kids, when you go to worship, they're going to see you there and that's a good example, right? It, it's a lot easier if the Apostle Paul would say this. You remember back in the good old days when we passed collection plates? I don't know if you do that now. I don't think where we attend will ever go back to that. We have baskets now. Um, but when we used to pass plates as a parent or a grandparent, did you ever slip that, your child or grandchild a nickel, a quarter, a dollar, right? And they drop it from up high of the mountain, you know, cling, you know, so... But, but the idea was this, why did we do that? Because we wanted them to learn to give, right? And so they see us give, they give themselves, they're learning through our example. I, I will propose this to you, it'd be a lot easier if the Apostle Paul was only talking about external actions in this text. Hey, you just live the right way, do the right things, and ultimately your kids are going to follow your footsteps and go to heaven. Well, first of all, we know better than that. But that's not what he's saying. So what is he saying then? Well, he's going to point to two key components. And there's only two. Two points, right? Now there's 15 subpoints today, but only two points. Now, two points. And I believe fully if we walk away with this class of saying, hey, I need to pay attention to these in my life. Because I have little eyes that are watching. My spouse is watching. My Maybe other children, maybe other Christians are watching. I need to pay attention to my example in these two areas. I think that it will be a blessing to our lives. So number one, I would offer this to you. The first place that we turn in chapter 8, we learn that the Apostle Paul says, imitate me in my attitude. And if you do so, it'll be as if you're imitating Christ Jesus. Now, I'll show you what I mean by that over in chapter 8, verse 1. This is where he says this, Now concerning things sacrificed to idols, we know that we all have knowledge, and knowledge makes arrogant, but love edifies. If anyone supposes that he knows anything, he has not yet known as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by him. Therefore, concerning the eating of things sacrificed to idols, we know that there is no such thing as an idol in the world. And that there's no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and we exist for Him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we exist through Him. However, verse 7, not all men have this knowledge, but some, being accustomed to the idol until now, Eat food as if it were sacrificed to an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. But food will not commend us to God. We are neither the worse if we do not eat, nor the better if we do eat. I want to stop there for just a moment. Because what I want you to see is what's going on in this text. In Corinth, out of all the struggles that they were having, there was another struggle of, you should know better than this, that was going on. Now, the reality is everybody in Corinth didn't come from the same background. Maybe they had different parents and uh, assuming they had different parents who taught them different things. They weren't all from the same family and had the same parents, right? So the idea was this. They all brought something to the table that was a little different. And some people brought a background of paganism. Actually, most of them would have at the time that the book of Corinthians was written. Uh, a background of paganism. But some were at a little different point in their journey of faith. Right Now, they would, they would have knowledge, but there was something that was missing with that knowledge. And that something that was missing was love. And here's what it would have looked like. you got two brothers, right? The subject of eating meat. 
This brother over here says this, I just can't eat that meat. I can't eat the meat. Why can't, why can't you eat the meat? I can't eat the meat because um, I know where it comes from. It comes from that place where they, uh, they're selling the meat that was sacrificed to the idols. And I, I, know, I know there's only one God, but I'm just struggling with where I come from and what that meat used to represent. And this guy over here says this, Are you serious? Don't you know there's only one God? You know those gods that our parents and grandparents used to talk about? You know they're not real. Therefore, you know this is just me. And this guy's going, I know you're right. I know you're right. I just, it's something within me that's bothering me. And this guy over goes, over, you should be more mature than that. You should be further advanced in your faith than that. You should be, and this is what, you should be like me. Knowledge makes what? Arrogant or puffed up. Now, knowledge is not bad. You gotta, you, your faith is based upon a knowledge of God, right? The Old Testament is a tutor to us to bring us to a point where we understand knowledge of God. Your faith is based upon the knowledge that you know of God and therefore you put that into practice in your life and you have footsteps that show that the knowledge has made its way past your head and into your life. So you walk by faith and not by sight. But all of that starts with knowledge. So the question then is, how can knowledge be so good and yet cause people to be puffed up? And the idea in this opening text is, when knowledge is not coupled with love, that's when it's bad. So, he's talking to his brother in Christ. They're both Christians. This guy just wants to eat the meat. He says, there's no restrictions. I can eat the meat. I have liberty to eat the meat. And this guy goes, I'm not arguing against that. I'm just struggling in my own conscience because of where I come from. Now, truth be known, this guy over here, he needs to mature. We're not going to let him get a free pass. He needs to mature. This guy over here needs to get off of his high horse. And he needs to understand that not everybody is where he is in their Christian, their faithful journey. And he needs to show more love than he does belittling. Now that's why knowledge can make arrogant, but love edifies. Love builds up. Knowledge only shows that you're puffed up. Right? So here's the deal. What the Apostle Paul does is he lands the plane when he drives home an attitude in the rest of this reading. Look, if you will, verse 9. He says, But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone sees you who have knowledge, dining in an idol's temple, will not his conscience, if he is weak, be strengthened to eat things sacrificed to idols? For through your knowledge... He who is weak is ruined. The brother for whose sake Christ died. And so by sinning against the brethren and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. So here's his attitude, verse 13. Therefore, I love therefore, it's a key word in Bible study. Therefore, if food causes my brother to stumble, I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause my brother to stumble. Now, look, I don't know about you. I find it amusing at times when the Bible talks about the weak and the strong. Because if I, in all the years that I've been in ministry and public speaking, and I, you, you ask audiences from time to time, um, are you the strong or the weak brother? I have yet to have an individual raise their hand or even acknowledge that they are the weak brother. We all see ourselves as the strong brother. We all see ourselves as the more mature Christian. Most, I say all, that may be too broad. Most see ourselves as the strong brethren. I've got to be, I'm just being honest with you, I'm probably both. In some things, I would say I'm probably more mature. But in other areas, I would probably say I've still got some growing to do in those things. And I can admit that, that I'm still a work in progress. I don't have, there's no, to me, look, there's no shame in being real on that one. But in the text, what the text is bringing forth is this. There are some people who are at different points in their spiritual journey. And the people who in that category have a conscience problem, 
if they are encouraged to violate their conscience, even though you have the liberty to do what you're doing, if you by your example and by your influence cause them to say, I'll bend, then you actually cause them to be, according to the text, ruined. That would be you're causing them to sin because they're no longer acting out of faith to God. They're going outside of that, right? Because their faith may say, look, I want to be faithful to God, therefore I can't eat that meat because I know where the meat was sacrificed at and to whom these people believed it was sacrificed to, right? This guy over here is saying, because of my faith, I will eat the meat. If one is, this guy over here is imposing his conclusions on this guy, then you actually can hurt them before their walk with God. But here's what's interesting. That guy in his Christian liberty can actually sin by practicing his liberty. Why don't you kind of just to swallow that pill for a second. You can do it, but you could also sin in doing it. <laughs> and the answer is not because the meat was tainted. The answer is because of the way they saw their brethren. Does that make sense? So here's the deal. That goes down to something that's not a, hey, just follow my, my you know, parking... Follow my car, you're the bumper sticker, right? Follow me to the Sunset Church of Christ. You ever seen those bumper stickers? I have. I don't put them on my car. You know why? Because I may want to cut you off and then honk my horn. And I want to put on there, follow me to such and such, you know, whatever church, right? I need to steal one of their bumper stickers, right? (laughs) But the idea is this. Uh, Sometimes you look at that and you say, well, this is my example. Follow me to whatever church of Christ. And okay, I'm going to follow you and I'm going to park right beside you and I'm going to sit right beside you and... I'm going to do what you do. And, and ultimately, at the end of the day, if that's what Paul were talking about, this would be so much easier. Because I really don't have to believe any of that to do it. I just believe that God wants me to do it, and I just do it. But here's the deal. He doesn't do that. He says, if your children and if your grandchildren followed you in your attitude towards your brethren, would it be said that they're following Jesus? That's so much more difficult. You know why? Because brethren irritate me. I'm glad they don't irritate you. I've heard it said before, and I've probably been guilty of saying it before, that ministry would be great if you didn't have to have people. <laughs> now, you, I hope you, you don't know me well enough to know. It's a joke. It's not fun. It's not real. But I can tell you this. In ministry, your headaches come from people. Okay? And in your life, guess what? If you're a school teacher, your headaches come from people. If you work in, you know, administration, your headaches come from people. I don't know where it wouldn't. Maybe unless you only work with animals, then it comes from animals. But then you got the anim- people who own the animals, right? But either way, people irritate. And sometimes when we get irritated, our attitudes hang out. And there have been the statements that have been made before that on the way home from a worship service in a car... Uh, people start talking about the preacher. Man, he went long. That preacher, I didn't really know what he was even saying. And if it's not the preacher, it would be somebody maybe in the congregation that they've had an issue with. Well, no, she didn't talk to me. He didn't even look my way. He was there, he shook everybody else's hand, but he didn't shake my hand. I guess we're still at odds with each other. And here's why that matters, is because there are little ears who are listening to the way we talk about brethren. There are little ears who are listening to the way we talk about the preacher, the way we talk about the elder, the way we talk about the church. And here's why this is a challenge. Because if you talk down about the church and about His people, why do you ever think your children and grandchildren would want to be a part of that? If you think it's that bad, why would they want what you think is bad? You're like, well, Joe, can we ever talk and voice frustrations? I would say yes, but I would say follow the Bible in the way that you do that, right? Because if I love you and there really is a problem between you and I, who am I supposed to go talk to about it? You. You. I think we would probably solve a lot of problems within our congregations if we followed that model. And that's based upon love, not based upon I'm going to be right and I'm going to show you that I'm right. It's I love you. And I don't want there to be anything uh, wrong between us. So Paul says this, I want your attitude toward your brethren. Now, he said it in a way that would be very difficult for me to say. If food causes my brother to stumble, I will never eat meat again. A couple things from that. Number one, if you're ever on Jeopardy and they ask a question, was Paul a meat eater or a vegetarian? 
you can assuredly say he was a meat eater. Because there's a little word in there, again. I will never eat meat again. You say, why do I need to know that? You don't. It's just one of those facts if you want to know about Paul. Okay? But what I love about this is he says this, I will give up something that I enjoy. I will give up something that I like for your sake. I want my children to know that's just not what I talk about, but that's what I do. Oh yeah, I could force my way. I could argue for my point. I have the liberty to argue for my point. And I may be settled on my point. But the reality is this. I want my kids to know more that I love my brethren more than I love my point. And Paul says, you better make sure your Christian liberty doesn't get in your way of your example. That's number one. Number two though, he goes into this idea, and of course I'm not going to deal with how attitudes can be shaped. They can. I don't believe that children are born from the womb racist. I don't. I think that's taught. I don't believe children are born from the room are born from the womb an Oklahoma fan. Amen. That's indoctrinated. Sorry if you're from Oklahoma. All right. I can't wait till Texas and Oklahoma moves to the SEC. Come on. I'm a Tennessee fan. Come on. We'll take it. But uh, the idea is this: our attitudes are shaped and molded, uh, and so that's what that was about, right? So if you know your your attitude can be changed, it can be shaped and molded. So can your kids. So can your grandchildren, right? Number two, though, the Apostle Paul calls them to follow his focus. So he calls them to follow his attitude, and he calls them to follow his focus. Those are your two points, okay? But where does that come from? That's what we want to know. Where does it come from? And so here's the deal. I want to read a passage of Scripture from chapter 9, and I want you to see, just based upon the text, if you can see what Paul's focus in his life is, okay? So I'm going to read for verses 19 and following, okay? For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all so that I may win more. To the Jews I became as a Jew so that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law as under the law, though not being myself under the law, so that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law as without law, though not being without the law of God, but under the law of Christ, so that I might win those who are without law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, so that I may by all means save some. I do all things for the sake of the gospel, so that I may become a fellow partaker of it. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. Therefore I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air. But I discipline my body and make it my slave, so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. I like another translation where he says, I buffet my body. We're going to buffet our bodies here in a little bit, right? Amen. But the idea behind that is this. Tell me what the goal of Paul's life is. Win souls. Win Win others for Christ. Now, for those of you who are in my last uh, class, I I told you I highlight and circle and do all kinds of things in my text because it helps me to see things, right? All these green lines down here, that is all of the so that I might win, so that I might win, so that I might win. All the circles are the so that's because it tells me All the reason behind why Paul did what he did. I became to a Jew as a Jew, to a Gentile as a Gentile, under the law as under the law, not under the law, not under the law. Why? So that. Now there's another so that though that occurs. I would offer to you, number one, to win souls, bring them to Jesus. What's another focus of his life? In this text. Only from this text. And it has to do with the ending there with the buffet our bodies. What did Paul not want to do? He didn't want to become disqualified himself. I propose to you today, Paul was very focused in his life. Now, Paul had an occupation outside of preaching. What was it? He was a tent maker. Now, here's what I also understand from a historical standpoint. Paul's tent making skills most likely were taught to him by his Jewish family. Because the Jews believed that by the time a young person reached the age of male... By the time he reached the age of 14, 15, they were marrying age at that point in that culture. That young person had to know how 
to make a living and support a family. And so the Jews took it upon themselves not only to make sure their children were studying the Torah, but they took it upon themselves to make sure they passed along a trait to those children. So Paul, saying that I'm a tent maker, most likely from a historical standpoint, he was taught tent making at a young age coming out of a Jewish family who would have been tent makers. Or at least he would have apprenticed under an individual who was a tent maker, right? And so when you look at that, you understand Paul had an occupation. He had a skill set, I guess is the best way to say that. On top of that, you read Paul's own writings uh, about who he was in the book of Philippians, and he'll tell you real quick, um, he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He studied under the greatest teachers. He was zealous to keep the law. Um, And so some might argue, well, his occupation was Phariseeism. Yeah, maybe, but he used tent making on his missionary journeys to, at times to support himself. But what I never read in the text is where Paul says, you know what, I want to become the greatest tent maker that's ever lived. I never read that Paul wanted all of his tents in the Cabela's magazine or in Bass Pro or in Academy. I don't ever read that he was at the Tent Maker Academy Awards and that they called him up on stage, uh, Paul, you are the best tent maker, here's your golden whatever. All I read is that Paul was a tent maker as a way to support his main missions. That's why he worked. So let me ask you a question. Why do you work? Why did you work if you're retired? Why? If you're wanting to follow Paul's lead, right? That's what this whole class is about. Follow me as I follow Christ. Right? If you follow me, it'll be like you're following Christ. Paul says, I want you to follow me in my focus. And I guess the challenge is, even for me, as I do what I do, is the question of why are you doing what you're doing? Why are you writing a book? Why are you recruiting for the College of Biblical Studies at Fried Hardeman? Why are you traveling the country preaching? Obviously, my goal is to lead people to Jesus. I want to connect people to Jesus so bad. I do. There's nothing special about me, but there's something special about Him. Let me bring you to Him, right? But, you know, the reality is if I'm working a a job, I've got to ask the why because the the purpose of the job's got to be in the scope of my focus. And I tell you, Paul's focus was very narrowed. He was. And that was this. I have become all things to all men so that by all means I may save some. Now, if you wanted to ask me in my life, I would tell you, My goals, I try to have the same. I want to not be disqualified myself. And I try to instill these in our children. You know, I probably have done a better job with our older two than our younger two. I I don't know if I'm just getting lazy. I need to kick up. That's That's a Joe, you need a kick in the pants moment, right? But if you were to ask my older two kids, what's our number one goal and our number two goal? Without me having to prompt them, they would have said, and would today, to go to heaven and to take as many people there with you as possible. And that's because I don't believe that needs to... uh, I don't think that is something that we can just have them learn through osmosis. I think we need to be uh, intentional in relaying to our children what our focus is. Now, the hard part, and this is where I tell you lessons sometimes smack me in the face. My kids hear my lessons more than you hear my lessons. And they see me at home. And they know... If dad's living a consistent life with what he's saying. And you think for one minute that doesn't weigh on me. And it hasn't at home made me think, if I don't respond in this way, my children are going to see a hypocrite. Because I don't have the luxury, and don't take this wrong, I don't have the luxury of never speaking up. This is what I do. And so my kids hear what I say, and then they see how I live. I better be consistent. There are a lot of preachers who've lost their children. And it may have been because of inconsistencies. I don't know. I don't want that to be my family's story. So here's the deal. I better keep as number one and number two going to heaven and taking as many people there with me as possible. I firmly believe that's what Paul did. And I would offer this to you. There's actually research out there that will show you and at least give reason to conclude that it's it's not bad to actually limit the focus of yourself and of your children and of your grandchildren. 
this particular study that I'm thinking of came out of Princeton University and it was one of those cases where they divided two groups up, put one as a, in a cluttered environment, one in a clean environment, and gave them the same uh, problems to solve, right? Now, I understand in a situation like that, there's a lot of variables that still exist. You can't control all the variables. But what they did conclude at the end of the day was that the children who completed the task in the clean and structured environment, they actually did better on the results of the task, and they were quicker and more efficient. Those who were in the cluttered environment, they did not do as well in their answers, and they were not as efficient in their timing. Now, that probably doesn't surprise you, right? You've heard probably all your life, hey, at, at my desk, I need to clean my desk, right? Don't look at my desk. Don't, do not judge my office by my sermon. Okay, that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> but the reality is this. I know where everything is in my, in my office, right? But I also know this. I probably would work better in a, an office environment that was probably more clean. I know that. We know that. You have heard this before. But I want you to try to relay that to the goals and the expectations of your children and grandchildren. What goals and expectations have you set within your home? Is your goal and expectation to get the best grades and go to the greatest college? Well, then don't be surprised if your children elevate that to the highest level. Is your goal for them to get a scholarship in sports and therefore everything's poured into that? Then do not be surprised if that is their highest endeavor. See, we, uh, we operate a little different. We're weird. Okay? We're, we're a homeschool family, but I also need to clarify that because sometimes it's, it causes issues. I am not the guy who says you have to homeschool or you don't love your kids. Okay, my mother was a public school teacher and, and retired from the state of Tennessee. If I talk bad about everybody, I'm talking bad about my own mama, and you don't do that in the southeast, okay? My brother's a school, a school teacher in college. I obviously have degrees. It's not that I don't believe in it. This is just what we've chosen to do with our kids. And quite honestly, from a practical standpoint, as much as we're on the road, I was on the road 49 times last year. If we didn't homeschool, I would never see my children, and I would not be doing what I'm doing. So this works for our ministry. It works for our family. But I've been the guy who said this to my children, and I'll say it to other people's kids at youth rallies. Moms and dads may not appreciate it. I'll say this. What I do know is this. When your kids get into uh, heaven, right, when there's judgment day, do you know that there are no report cards that are owed on judgment day? You're, God's not going to say, tell me what you got in 10th grade history. He's not going to say, did you get a D? You know, He's not going to ask, well, where'd you go to school? Oh, you went to a technical college. You didn't go to Harvard. Never mind, you get in the back. On Judgment Day, there are no transcripts that are owed. Whether your children were on the dean's list, whether they got all A's or all B's, it will not help them on that day. But whether or not they knew Jesus, I didn't say knew about Him. I said whether or not they knew Him. That'll make all the difference. You do know the difference, right? I can tell you all day long. I, I get to study culture quite a bit. And I, I've been to some of these areas and went through uh, Mississippi once. And there's a hardware store there that a famous individual uh, bought a guitar at once. And he uh, came from very humble means, but he arose to a very high level in our culture. As a matter of fact, he sang a song that was being sung by other people. It was just in the wrong timing. So our, our nation went through an ugly period of racial tension. Y'all know that. And I'm not suggesting that. We don't still have some growth to do, but it did, it did happen. And there was music at that time. Historians will call it race music is what they call it. It was where the DJs couldn't play it on the air because it didn't fit the, the acceptable music because it came oftentimes from African-American individuals. So they played it at night. And suburban white American kids were sneaking down to the radio that was only in the room because it was the size of a car, right, in the main room. And they were listening to the music late at night. Well, there was a big, if you know your history, you know there was a lot of payment under the table, a lot of DJs taking money under the table, a lot of cultural problems that came from that area. But here comes this guy on the scene. He had the accepted color of skin. And uh, he had a good look to him, and uh, he had a right sound. And eventually Ed Sullivan said that he was a pretty good boy, but the first time he went on the show, they wouldn't even pan down to his hips because he had a problem with them, right? But once Ed Sullivan said he was a pretty good boy, then he was accepted into mainstream America and would later become the king of rock and roll. Who am I talking about? Now, I just told you a lot of facts about somebody. <laughs> this has only backfired to me one time in my entire time of the <laughs> 
but you don't know Elvis. There was a lady in one of my audiences who said, I dated him. Yeah, I'm assuming that has not happened here. But I told you a lot of facts about him. But that doesn't mean you know him. You can teach your kids and grandkids and even yourself facts about God and Jesus, but not know Him. On the day of judgment, your report card won't matter. The scholarship they got won't matter. But whether or not they know Jesus will matter. So in our home, here's what I say. Son, because I don't have to say this to my daughter because she's a, she's a self-motivated, right? Son, you can get into heaven with C's, but you may not get out of your room here in my house. <laughs> Here's the thing is C's get degrees. You know, and the reality is they do. They do. Let's be honest, you go apply for a job, they're not asking, show me your transcript. They don't know if you got a C or a D in the class. And then you say, Joe, why are you putting so much emphasis on that? Here's why. Because sometimes we put the wrong emphasis on the wrong syllable. And we instill that in the lives of our children. And they leave going, my main focus is to get into college. My main focus is to get a scholarship. My main focus is to get good grades. And I just wonder how many of us would do better off to say, no, your main focus is to bring honor and glory to God. Your main focus is to make sure you're not disqualified and to take as many people there with you as possible. You say, where's that found? Well, I need to get this made into a t-shirt because it would be pretty cool. But before I get to 11.1 where he says, be imitators of me just as I also am of Christ, he says in chapter 10, verse 31, Whatever, whether then you eat or drink. See, he goes back to the eating part of chapter 8. That's why I tell you, this is a paradigm. Whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. What am I about? Bringing glory to God. When my feet hit the ground out of my bed, what am I about? I better be about bringing honor and glory to God. What's that look like today? I don't know. I don't know who He's going to bring into my life. I don't know what circumstances I'm going to face. I don't know what problems I'm going to face. But what I'm about is already settled. In whatever comes my way, I'm about bringing honor and glory to God. And here's why that matters. You guys just got some snow. It was funny. There was another brother here who was in my last class who lived in like Canada. And I think he called people around here sissies or some word. <laughs> right? He said, they just shut everything down. And I'm like, well, Tennessee, if it just gets a sprinkle, we're shutting it down. Right? But um, in Pennsylvania is where I spent my high school days. Dad was a preacher up in Pennsylvania, not too far from Lake Erie. So we got the lake effect snows. And... Um, I mean, we're talking three, four foot is nothing in a field, right? But if you've ever looked at a freshly fallen field of snow, it's beautiful. But now I want you to imagine this. I want you to imagine a toddler who's probably not only three feet tall anyway, looking at a field that's got about three to four foot of snow. And you got to get from point A to point B, from one side to the other. And here's what dad and here's what mom does. They say this to the child, stay there. And then here's what mom does and dad. That's called cutting a path, right? Mm -hmm. And then they look back at the child and they say, just step where I stepped and you'll be fine. I don't want my kids to step in some of the steps that I've stepped. Can I just be real with you? Because my line through that field, it doesn't look like this. But that's okay. Because there's grace and there's mercy. Here's what my line more looks like. And you say, Joe, you probably should work on that. And here's what I want you to see. Where I'm at now is far better than where I started. And so while the current turns were bigger, maybe when I was younger and living it up, as I've aged, we're getting closer to that center line on a more regular basis. Does it still look like this? Yeah. And here's the deal. My kids know that they don't have a perfect dad. They do know that their dad is perfected by the blood of Jesus. They do know that they have a dad that wants to run back to center 
as quick as he can. I want them to see a dad who's not afraid to say, I'm sorry. I want them to see a dad who's not afraid to say, I was wrong. I shouldn't have talked to your mom that way. I want them to see a dad who maybe I let something slide on the TV. And let me tell you, we use ClearPlay and VidAngel like crazy. But occasionally, maybe I get distracted or maybe I I get tired. You ever gotten tired of holding the line? And I'm grateful that Erin is in my life because she was regularly cheerleading, encouraging. And as I try to do for her, where you got two people who are trying to be what God's called them to be, and you got four kids who are watching them. And here's what this lesson does. It punches me. Because the question is this. If Colton Camden, if Michaela and Bennett stepped where Daddy steps, would it be said that they're following Jesus? You see, I see my kids' faces. And you see yours and your grandchildren. The issue is not, is your line straight? The issue is... How quick are you trying to get back to center? By repentance, right? Man, Paul, just tell me to take them to church. Come on. (laughs) Just tell me to give them money to put in the collection plate. Just tell me, you know, hey, this is how you teach them to shave. Don't challenge me. Is my attitude right and is my focus right? Because all of a sudden now you're asking me to make some changes in my life if it needs to be made. I have to bite my tongue. I got to not just bite my tongue. I got to change my attitude to reflect Jesus Christ. Who when He was rebuked and He was mistreated, what did He do? He uttered what? No threat. Could He have? Yeah. But He didn't. I want to be more like that. I need to be more focused in my goals, in my life. Sometimes that's hard as a guest speaker. It's an honor to be invited to speak here. It really is. Sometimes men struggle with that who are in my line of work because success is oftentimes viewed what venue did you get invited to speak at. So when I travel and talk to school of preaching students, I'll tell them, uh, you may never get invited to speak at a lectureship, but that doesn't mean that you're not a loud voice in the hands of God. You be who you are intended to be in His hands at your work, and you do well. I don't know. You see me for who I am. You're like, man, I didn't know him. Good, you probably still don't. (laughs) But what I want you to know is this. um, The Scriptures can even convict the speakers. So you and I are blessed. I I don't know what time, but I have been over every time, so I'm going to quit now. Let's have a word of prayer. I I did tell the last class this. Kyle Publications, as a speaker, I get a booth, but I'm only here today. So I didn't ask Zane for a booth, but I did bring a sampling of the products that we offer at Kyle Publications. Um, you'll find stuff back there, Ladies Bible Studies, a new book I wrote for men. I would really like to not to take any of those home with me. Uh, we're a nonprofit, but we do ask for a payment for the stuff. Everything you purchase will go into producing new material. Aaron and I do not make a dime off of Kyle Publications. It is a nonprofit uh, labor of love, quite honestly, because we believe the Lord's Church needs good resources. So I'd be honored if you'd take a look at it. Don't feel pressure. Y'all have been awesome coming to my class. Thank you so much. Let's end with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, you are so wonderful and we love you. And Lord, as we readily admit today that there are challenges in our lives that really draw us back to a, a concern or a fear or maybe just an awareness that uh, we've got eyes that are watching us, ears that are listening, and people are stepping in our footprints. And Lord, I pray that, that as we go through this life, that we will not run away from that, that we will embrace that. Um, We hear people say all the time, I'm not a role model, Lord, but we we need good role models. And so I pray that everyone in this class, everyone who might listen to this lesson, Lord, that we would engage that understanding what we've learned today from the Scriptures, that it's not just about our externals, it's also about our internals. And so, Lord, we pray that internally um, we are where you would have us to be, and if not, we pray that we continue to work towards that end. We do love you, Lord. Please do not grow weary of us. Please continue to be patient with us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. I appreciate you.